My life's always been fish. Uh, my background has been fish ever since I was a very, very small boy. Even to the point of my first word was, was feet pointing at my grandfather's fish tank. My whole professional career has been within the world of aquaculture, primarily sub-Saharan Africa, working on community projects, trying to build aquaculture as a means of, of protecting the livelihoods of the fishermen and also protecting biodiversity on the continent. Fishing is the largest informal business practice and, and income generator um, around Lake Victoria. Everyone who lives around Lake Victoria um, has grown up eating tilapia and has grown up eating fish. Um, fishing is kind of very integral to the community lifestyle in this area. But for many different reasons, the fishery, the wild fishery, has absolutely crashed in the last few years. The natural fishery has declined by between 70 and 90 percent in the last 10 to 15 years. So you've got this huge potential, this huge resource, A, in the lake, but also in the people and the communities but there is no work, there is no income. When we came here, we found this incredible opportunity, not just to grow a business, but also to grow a community. And without that support, it's impossible to, to grow, it's impossible to succeed. You can get any piece of paper you want from the highest office in the land. If you don't have the support from the people on the ground, the project is doomed from the beginning. This community here in Subert, Royal Bay and Homer Bay, welcomed us from day one with open arms and it's, it's a huge part of the reason why we're here today. So we came to Kenya basically to ask three questions. Can we grow fish here? Can we sell fish here? And is it going to be a conducive environment to build a business? Those came back emphatically yes on every single front. It's a perfect environment to grow tilapia. Tilapia evolved to be in this region. Tilapia is from here and, and it's produced all over the world in different environments, different temperatures, but this is Tilapia's home. It's the perfect place to grow it. Kenya, incredible market opportunity to sell fish. 55 million people, growing disposable income, and an incredible unmet demand for the product. Victory Farms is a fully vertically integrated fish farm. Um, we deal essentially with everything from the hatching of, of tilapia eggs uh, right the way through to harvesting them, um, distributing them and selling them eventually to the end consumer. The first fish went into the water in June of 2016. The growth at Victory Farms has been rapid. I mean, when I joined we were harvesting maybe seven tons a day, twice a week. At this moment we're able to push through tens of tons every single day um, through our processing platform. The infrastructure development has been rapid. We've gone from harvesting fish kind of on the grass to a state-of-the-art processing facility. Farm one of Victory Farms is located in, in Roe Bay in Homa Bay County. And the farm is located around the shores of Lake Victoria, a lake shared by Tanzania and Uganda. Tilapia, as a species, it's a mouth brooder. What does that actually mean? It means so the, the female tilapia, once they've spawned, she actually keeps the eggs inside her mouth. So as they go, they spin around in these beautiful tight circles when they're spawning, and she picks up those fertilized eggs, holds them in her mouth for, depending on the condition, somewhere between seven to nine days. What we're doing as a farm is actually collecting the eggs direct from the female's mouth, and then effectively, creating an artificial fish mouth. As the female fish is breathing in water and pushing it back out through her gills, every time she does that, a fresh supply of clean oxygenated water passes over the eggs. And what our system here, with some relatively high-tech technologies, we recreate that within the hatchery building. So the water is continually cycling through very high quality water, but also allow a degree of exposure to pathogens to try to allow that egg and that, that very young fish to develop its own immunity. Once they're actually gone from an egg, a little round fish egg, and turned into a fish, we then take them from the hatchery and take them out to our ponds where we nurse them in a very stable environment. So each one of our ponds, we sort of maximize the natural potential of that water. By managing the water quality in there, we can protect that fish through its sensitive early stages. So you have this, this nurtured environment, which is very precisely nurtured 
in the hatchery and then more extensively nurtured out in the ponds, which then gives you a very strong animal that you can then stock out to the cages to grow in the cages. On the lake, we receive fish at about 0.2 grams. Those fish are stocked into six meter square cages at a rate of about 150,000 pieces of fish per cage. The fish will spend more or less 30 to 35 days in those cages before being moved to our grading platform. We've got two stages of grading. Um, our nursery grade happens when the fish are about 30 days old in the lake and at about three grams. The grading process essentially involves separating the fish by size to optimize both on feed and on cage space, ensuring that we're feeding each individual piece of fish the feed that is adequate for it. Our second grading stage happens at 30 grams. During this stage, again, we grade and count our fish to ensure that we have an accurate estimation of our biomass and the total number of pieces that we've got in each of our cages. From this stage, they're then stocked into our large circular cages in what we call our production stage. The production stage lasts around 140 to 160 days, during which time the fish attain a weight of 450 grams, which is our ideal harvest weight. The harvesting process is state-of-the-art. We've got cranes mounted on a large 20-ton harvesting barge. These cranes assist us to pull out tens of tons of fish from a cage on a daily basis. These fish, once harvested from the cage, within seconds are dropped onto beds of ice. This ice ensures that they are humanely slaughtered. And from that point, they're then loaded onto bespoke four-ton boats and driven straight across to our, to our land-based site. From there, they then begin their, their journeys through to, through to our customers. Victory Farms is very proud to have its own logistic capability. When processing is done, the fish is then handed over to the fleet team who transport it to the three logistic centers that we have. One is located in the farm, and then we have another one in Nairobi and in Kisumu. This is where the fish is aggregated before distributing to the 50 locations that we have across the country. We operate in the low-income neighborhoods to ensure that we're making available affordable protein to each and every Kenyan because people accessing affordable protein is a very major problem in the country. Because of the areas where we operate and the lack of consistent power supply, we run a branch network that is non-electrified. We actually use a commercially graded cooler box that is able to maintain temperature to up to 72 hours and more if the stock is managed properly. We have integrated a system of tracking temperature throughout the journey and that has been digitalized and it is monitored at the LC level in the different sections and we make sure that by the time of receiving, temperature checks must be done and they must be compliant with Kenya Fisheries. It is in our effort to ensure accountability along the distribution process. Gutting and scaling is already done at the farm. So by the time the market woman is coming to pick up the fish at the branch, all she has to do is the salting and the frying process, which has cut down her preparing process and made her more efficient with her time. Victory Farms has been able to provide a much better quality in the market. This is something that is stamped by the market women themselves. Most of them have been in business for more than 20 years and they stand behind the product that Victory Farms is providing. They appreciate the fact that the product is fresh, it's of high quality and it's consistent and they're able to build a business on the back of what Victory Farms is doing. The commercial strategy is to make sure that we are collecting data at every point of sale. Each customer's data is collected and we're tracking that on a daily basis to be able to predict trends, to see and highlight, pick out trends. That will also help the farm to be able to know what to produce. A lot of our feed planning is guided by data and by a software called Aqua Manager. Aqua Manager essentially makes use of big data, models that we've plugged in based off of our historical performances on growth rates, on specific feed rates, and on FCRs. Using all of this data that we've accrued over the last six years of operations, we're then able to predict and make kind of very, very real-time estimations on the amount of feed that we, we should be putting into any given cage, and also to forecast several months into the future as to what feed we will need 
based off of the data that we've got on the number of fish that we have in the water at any given point in time. For every transaction to happen, customers' data needs to be collected all over again and the amount they've spent, the sizes they've taken for that day entered into the system. At that point, we're also able to, to make decisions about pricing because we can be able to measure and see how the supply and demand work. We work with a system known as Bend. It's an iCloud system that allows us to track sales real time. Over the years, we have been very good at collecting data. So we have collected data on all the 50 locations and we're able to see uh, the sales trend of each branch all the way down to a particular size. The payment process, just to ensure the safety of our team and to avoid them handling cash, is built upon a mobile banking system where the customer will come and they will pay through a pay bill number that is provided and is unique to every branch to allow for tracking of payments and to make sure that the finance department, once they step in, they can be able to see and track all the payments. Innovation is something that we, we do all the time. We, we love to to question conventional wisdom. The whole tilapia industry, this is an industry that goes back, well, record say 4,000 years, it probably predates that way, way beyond that. 95% plus of tilapia production globally is still done using the same principles, the same methods that people were using more than 100 years ago. A big part of our ethos of a company is to strip everything down to, to the absolute basics, get back to first principles and think, okay, well, this is how it's done but why is it done like that it may well be that the old way is the correct way more often than not we're finding it isn't the big limitations that we have today to stay on growth has always been the finite capacity of the core farm now in order to solve that we've we've come up with this this, this wonderful inclusive partnership model where we work with local landowners and effectively we, we build an asset, build a pond on their land, turn that into an egg production unit, and then that unit then supplies the core farm with eggs. But if the pond is far away, the challenge to us was, okay, well, how do we do that? So the idea that we're developing at the moment is we actually use drones to, to photograph the pond from above, and then that aerial shot, then it generates an RGB code for the water color. And based on that color, the principle is, okay, we can then infer things about the history of the pond, but also how it's trending, and then make decisions on, on, on fertilization rates, on, on flushing of that pond with different water. So it's, it's effectively developing a management tool that we can use for the ponds without actually having to be at the ponds. Victory Farms gave me the opportunity to put into practice kind of everything that I learned at university. If I think back to myself when I started at Victory Farms, kind of fresh out of uni with a master's degree, and I think of myself now, kind of running production at the biggest aquaculture company in East Africa, in, in my country, in Kenya, the growth is, is, is really, really evident in that, and I will be forever grateful. This farm will live long beyond me. It's almost this, this sort of legacy thing for me. It's this something that we are building here that will last. Building something that, that protects the environment, that enhances biodiversity, that empowers community, that grows and develops people. And of course, at the same time, it's an engine for growth economically as well. We can then take this model and grow it and expand it and scale it across, across different regions and different geographies. Almost all of our CSR work that we've done in the community has been driven by the community themselves. It's not for us to dictate what people need or want. When we first came here, one of the things that we realised about, about this community, about this area, was there was a lot of waterborne disease in the drinking water. The village's local community would go to the lake and they would be collecting their drinking water from the house in exactly the same location as they were doing their washing, their daily ablutions and as the cattle were drinking. A commitment that we made from day one to the community was we wanted to bring them clean drinking water. So as we fenced the farm, the time we blocked off access to the lake itself, at that same day we launched the community drinking water project which supplies incredibly low cost drinking water and it's given out free at the farm gate to anybody in the local community. 
Our environmental protection zones are essentially demarcated areas around our concessions and around our, our pier, which is our water extraction point. And they are designed to ensure that no kind of chemical fishing and no pollution and kind of nothing that wouldn't be beneficial to fish farming is allowed anywhere near our fish or into our waters. One of the kind of most incredible things that we've seen as a result of these EPZs is the bouncing back of some species that were thought to be extinct through kind of the preservation and regeneration of their breeding grounds. Conservation International have validated that these EPZs have had a, a real impact in bringing back and regenerating some of these breeding zones and species which are thought to be extinct. In the last 10, 15, 20 years, the lake has been massively overfished. So tilapia farming has represented a fantastic alternative for many of these local communities to um, get back to essentially having high nutritional diets insofar as it provides a far more consistent supply of tilapia than the wild catch does now. There's this enormous unmet need for fish. There's this unmet need for protein, for nutrition in this part of the world. And okay, for us as a business, but also for myself personally, that's why we do it. Yes, we could grow fish, but I could be growing salmon in Scotland. But for what? Here, you're building something. Yes, it's a wonderful commercial scale of operation, but you're building something that actually does good, that actually feeds people, that actually serves a need for a population that is, is, is growing all the time. When we look at FAO figures, this population is going to double in the next 20 years. And there's not enough food today. And unless we can solve that, well, who knows what happens. It has to be for impact, there has to be value behind it. 